Hello, and welcome to Documentary Film. And this week we're at Module 12. And we're going to take a look at a movie called Grizzly Man. That's our feature presentation. Uh, short little uh, bit of information on Grizzly Man, uh, made in 2005. Uh, using American money, so it's considered an American documentary film, but it's directed by a German, very famous German director, Werner Herzog. Uh, what is the film about? Well, it's about the life and death of grizzly bear enthusiast Timothy Treadwell. So the film includes some of Treadwell's own footage. In fact, most of the film is structured around these basically home movies, just like we saw last week with Roger and me, the week before that with Capturing the Freedmans. There's a real fascination with home home footage or home movie footage. And this is essentially what structures this film. And so uh, Treadwell uh, went to visit these grizzlies for well over a decade and documented all of these interactions. Uh, but he did die in 2003. We also see interviews with uh, people that knew uh, Timothy, uh, Timothy uh, friends uh, that he grew up with uh, when he was in California, his, his family, and uh, also professional people that interacted with him uh, in his uh, sort of his interest to call attention to the plight of the grizzly bear. Uh, now, Treadwell and his girlfriend uh, and Hunard, both originally from New York State, uh, both lost their lives to the grizzly bear attack of October 6th, 2003. Uh, and what is remarkable is Treadwell's footage was found after his death. And it actually contains sound, but luckily not video, but audio of, of, the, of his own death. And uh, we don't hear it, but there is a very uh, visceral scene in the middle of the film where Herzog is listening to essentially the, the death of the star of, of the film. So that's a very, very important part. Okay, so the, the bear that killed Treadwell and Huonard was late, later encountered, uh, discovered and killed uh, by a group uh, who had retrieved the semi-digested remains of the victim. Uh, there's an audio recording of the attack, as I say, that was captured on Treadwell's camera, but it was never released. We don't hear it. And the final film was uh, co-produced uh, by Discovery Docs, uh, Discovery Channel's theatrical documentary unit and Lionsgate Entertainment. And the music that you hear all through it, quite beautiful, by British singer-songwriter and guitarist uh, Richard Thompson. So, uh, Grizzly Man, uh, an interesting film, and I think, at least for me, uh, this is now my second time teaching this course, and this is the film that stuck with me the most. Uh, this is the one that haunted me the longest. Uh, because it is a remarkable film, what Herzog does with it. So what I want to do is kind of unpack it a little bit so we have a better idea of what's going on. So this is a quote from uh, Herzog. Uh, yes, it's found footage, but I think Treadwell uh, always wanted to be the movie star of his own films. We even see how he, st he stages himself, how he directs himself, how he repeats one take after the other. I mean, sometimes we know he's done at least 15 takes before he would uh, also pre-select, right? He didn't want to show some of his takes. What survives in his footage is maybe takes two, three, take number 14. So there's something going on here that isn't just home movies. It isn't just, okay, well, let's set up the camera here and do something. Treadwell, as we'll find out in the film, uh, did have or aspired to have an acting career. And that kind of went south uh, rather quickly, but there was still this desire to, to make a film. And that's really kind of the, the charm of the film because there are some beautiful, beautiful shots all the way through. Now, that is the star of the film, Timothy Treadwell. But the filmmaker, right, the director of this film, Grizzly Man, is Werner Herzog. Uh, Herzog has been working in the uh, fiction tradition for a lot longer than the documentary. And uh, he basically has a history of, of really going after characters who are larger than life, that are almost superhuman. And they're, they're often dreamers, they're maniacs, megalomaniacs. Uh, and somehow each one of them has this one desire to triumph over nature. Now, I don't want to say that's a necessary, necessarily German thing, but it is certainly something that appears in German philosophy uh, as a kind of recurring theme. So to have Herzog as a, as a German, uh, make these films and be interested in these kinds of subjects shouldn't be surprising. Uh, but I don't want to be stereotypical or make, you know, paint him as a caricature. Herzog has made other types of films, but 
There's something about the characters that he creates, and in this case, in a documentary, that really are doing the same thing. They're hoping to triumph over nature. And in this case, with uh, Timothy Treadwell, to somehow triumph over, over the grizzly bear, to be, able, to be able to live with them. And of course, uh, when you aim for the stars or you try to fly close, too close to the sun, you burn your wings, right? And often that's what these films are about. They're about not only this maniacal dream to triumph over nature, but it's the crash and burn, right? It's that sometimes slow, sometimes quick descent into nothingness. And in this case, it's a film about a person who had the best of intentions, but perhaps didn't realize how dangerous this act could be to him. Maybe in the back of his mind, but somehow he would like to kind of put it out of, out of the way and not think about it. Now, this is a very short list of uh, films that Herzog has starred. These are not starred, but directed. These are fiction films. Aguirre, The Wrath of God. Um, I, there's a five minute intro that I will make sure to have a link to for you to see, which is ab absolutely remarkable. The music, the visuals, everything works together to give you this almost awe inspiring grandeur of the mini school nature of ourselves versus the unrelentingness of nature itself. Uh, Fritz Corraldo, uh, shot in Peru. Very briefly, this is the story of this maniac that wants to build an opera house in the middle of the Amazon jungle and manages to get a group of, uh, well, essentially slaves to carry this massive boat up the side of a mountain from one lake to another lake. Now, there's no CGI. The crew actually did this. It, it was insane. So Herzog not only is attracted to these types of characters, he kind of is one himself because Fritz Corraldo is an insane story. I mean, you, the majority of this film is this huge boat. I mean, it's a steamboat being dragged physically by human, not no chains, no pulleys, by just human strength up the side of a mountain. Incredible. Uh, Rescue Dawn, we're now in Vietnam, and then Grizzly Man, Alaska. So notice that these places are... are at times inhospitable or just downright dangerous. The Amazon, you know, Alaska, Vietnam, these are, these are places where humanity clashes with nature. And that's why Herzog really likes to work in these kind of environments. Now for Tre Treadwell, this is kind of smaller scale. Uh, his encounter with bears, certainly for Herzog, would, he would have found that appealing because there is a kind of balance between humanity and nature. Uh, but how does Herzog see nature? That's a good question. Uh, inhospitable, right? Silent, cruel. Uh, it does what it does when it needs to do it. And as much as we as individuals may plan and we have, you know, consciousness and self-consciousness and intentionality and agency and so on, that can be wiped out in a few seconds. When nature wishes to do something, it moves and it accomplishes it. So, how does Herzog see nature as a very, very powerful force? So the common denominator of the universe is not balance, but in fact, chaos, hostility, and murder. And this is a line from the, from the film. So the universe is, is unforgiving. It can be chaotic. It can be openly hostile uh, and sometimes murderous in the case of animals. But we, we know that. It's, it's how close we want to get to it, right? How close we want to get to the fire. And that, of course, is what Herzog finds fascinating about these kinds of characters. They seem to, to not have a filter, right? They're not, they don't seem to know how dangerous nature can be. Another line here, uh, what haunts me is that in all the faces of all, of all the bears that Treadwell, Treadwell ever filmed, I discover no kinship, no understanding, no mercy. I see only the overwhelming indifference of nature. To me, there is no such thing as a secret world of the bears. And this blank stare speaks only of the half bored interest in food. Wow. <laughs> that is a line, a couple of lines from the film. So nature is, is cruel, relentless, but it doesn't care. Nature is not emotional. Uh, nature doesn't take sides. And the blank stare speaks only of half, a half bored interest in food. Wow, I have never seen a line, you know, reduce us and our complexity, our human complexity, down to just simply being a next meal. But that's kind of what happens, right? That's what happens in the film. 
Uh, Timothy crosses the line he will, that, uh, that we will not cross. It is clear to me that park services are not his enemy. So what's happening here is what Herzog is really filming for us is the descent into madness, not even hopelessness and despair, but the kind of madness that Treadwell uh, believes he is in fact, you know, capable of mastering. He thinks that he can live for the grizzly bears, but they're bears, right? And bears get hungry. And so the the chaos and hostility and murderous rage of animals, sure, it's there. But we seem to have a filter in our heads, or at least we ought to, uh, have a filter that tells us only come this far, right? Only antagonize an animal this much. Because we know, I mean, antagonize even a, you know, a dog in a backyard, guess what? You're, you're going to get bit because the animal doesn't care. They're not going to, you know, I'm going to come back later. No, boom, they're going to bite because it is chaotic and hostile if we choose to interact with it in that way. So what's happening here is the, the film explores that and explores how uh, individuals can descend into this false sense of security, which is really kind of what happens. That's, that's Treadwell's madness. Right, this false sense of security that he thinks he can he can live amongst the grizzly bear that they somehow will respect him and know who he is and it would that would have been lovely but it didn't happen right grizzly bears get hungry and whether it's timothy treadwell or somebody else it doesn't matter they're just looking at you as food so this is something that herzog really is fascinated by so the film as he says is not about a balance in nature but about a battle right between the human, our human nature, and the natural world. Now, usually it's not a battle because most of us are sensible enough to not engage with uh, that world. I mean, certainly to not put ourselves out there where we put ourselves, in, uh, put ourselves in harm's way, right? In the way of danger. So if we are going to do that, we want to make sure that we are protected and that we know fully what is about to happen. So the film is about this ba uh, battle between these two forces you know one is hostile chaotic murderous but indifferent right it doesn't take sides again it's it's not emotional it's it's nature and us and how we choose to interact with it now there's also uh the battle not only between human nature and the natural world but there's also a kind of battle going on between herzog uh the director and treadwell the sort of director main subject and if you can think of the, there's a, almost a film within a film here, but really the person who is the final say is Herzog because he shot well over, uh, well, Treadwell had over a hundred hours worth of material for Herzog to go through. So Treadwell shoots all this footage uh, in the hopes of doing something with it. We're not sure, but he did shoot a ton of material. But Herzog is the one who finally constructs the film that we see today. And so, uh, Herzog has the ability to organize the material, to have it say something, to, to focus on a kind of narrative, an unfolding of a story. And the story in this case is how the battle eventually is lost, right, between human nature and the natural world. But there is a kind of antagonism between Treadwell as the character and Herzog as the filmmaker. And the filmmaker who takes Treadwell's material, right, his home footage, and reconstructs it to tell perhaps a different story. Because certainly this would not have been a story that Treadwell would have wanted to present to us. Um, he did not expect to die either. But here it is. Here is this material that we're using, uh, that he is using for us to look at. So both Treadwell and Herzog are filmmakers. They are somewhat egomaniacal, um, but they have different perspectives on the subject matter. Obviously, Treadwell wishes to present the grizzly bear in a positive manner because that's really his his thing. That's what he wants to do. But Herzog is more interested in how dangerous they are. And so he will select material to reflect this different point of view. So we have Timothy Treadwell, the filmmaker, and Timothy Treadwell, the uh, the main character, right, of, of this story, right? The the proverbial grizzly man. And so we have these, these two kind of individuals, of course, coexisting in one. Uh, that has tried to construct a film that never was finished, uh, but he is the center of the story, no, no matter what. And he is, at various times, a protector of bears, right? I am the samurai warrior when challenged. Uh, sure, okay. Uh, but if he were ever challenged by the same bear that eventually killed him, 
that would have been it. And luckily enough, he was there for long enough to be able to enjoy that brief time with those animals. But as a protector of bears, absolutely. Uh, was that foolish? Yeah, many people think that it was very foolish. Um, now, Treadwell does some odd things at various times. Um, when he looks at the camera, he talks to the camera, it's almost like he's confessing, uh, perhaps confessing an inability to live with other people. Now, he's not misanthropic. A misanthrope is someone that just hates people, right? It's not that. He's He's been burned. He's been burnt, uh, you know, with a, a failed acting career. Uh, relationships didn't exactly go perfectly well. So when he's around these grizzly, uh, the grizzly bears, he kind of feels more at home. He feels more comfortable and allows his vulnerability to come through, which is why when he's facing the camera and talking, there is a kind of a confessional tone to his to his words. Um, so he also sees things differently. Uh, as Herzog says, you know, part the park services people, he looks at them as enemies. Somehow they're not helping the, the grizzly bear. Meanwhile, they're telling him, said, look, you know, you've got to get out of here. This is dangerous. And in fact, when he did, uh, when he was killed, he was told to leave. And he came back at a time in the fall when animals are ready to hibernate and they're looking for food. He knew this and the park services people told him to stay away, but he still went. Uh, photographers and filmmakers he sees as poachers. There's a, there's a strange scene quite early in the film where he sees other people kind of encroaching on his land. I mean, it's a, it's a park. It's a national park, but he looks at it as his domain. So he's almost acting as if he himself is, is bear-like, right? That he belongs to this, this, you know, tribe, uh, of, of animals, of grizzlies that are feeling threatened by, in this case, just photographers. Right. That's all it is. They're not even hunters. So there is really a series of strange sort of moments that we see in Treadwell's, uh, Treadwell's life that tell us that he does have a bit of a skewed view of the world, especially the, the grizzly world, thinking that he is their friend, that they are, you know, they're, they're not dangerous, that people that are there to help him are actually his enemies. So it is, it is kind of odd to consider that. There's also um, a real lack of footage of his girlfriend who was there, uh, Amy uh, Huguenar, who died along with, with him in the, the grizzly attack. We see her at the very, very tail end. I mean, Herzog mentions her only towards the tail end. And we see her for maybe three or four seconds, almost just by accident. So she'd been there the whole time. Uh, that makes the interactions with, with uh, you know, human beings kind of strange because even though she's there, She's never addressed, like he never even speaks to her. He's, the Treadwell speaks directly to the camera. So that's Treadwell. Now the director of this film, uh, Grizzly Man, Werner Herzog, um, he's the other egomaniac in the film. Uh, and he's, he's, he is an egomaniac in the sense that through the editing of this footage that Treadwell shot, Herzog, in a sense, supersedes uh, Treadwell's story. He overtakes his story. So he changes the narrative, uh, changes the perspective of the film, changes the perspective of, of the footage that is there because Treadwell is trying to show grizzly bears in a positive light. And Herzog is saying, sure, they might be cute from far away, but they're, they're dangerous animals. And so his choice of footage is really kind of counterintuitive to what Treadwell would have likely done had he lived, had he gone back to where he was, he was stationed to work on this footage. So it's, uh, you know, it starts off as a typical story traveling to Alaska, which is, which is where this park is. And he would go there during the summer months. And the, the story, you know, it's kind of unfolds on its own. We don't hear Herzog sort of interjecting very much in the film, uh, you know, kind of an, in an expository kind of way. But the narrative does change over the duration of the film. Uh, Herzog becomes a more dominating figure in the in the story, and there's a, there's even a part where Herzog says, you know, I would have not done that, and it's like, wow, that is the most unexpository moment you can imagine. The voiceover uh, narration, although the images should be at the service of of the the word, Herzog is literally contradicting what Treadwell is doing. You know, I wouldn't have done that. So the narrative becomes 
more and more in the possession of Herzog and further away from Treadwell. So that is a kind of thing that is going on in the film. Now, what is re remarkable is the film does have at least five of the six modes of uh, documentary. Okay, now, the one that isn't in there is poetic. I would say there are some poetic moments in there. There are some beautiful, lovely moments. Uh, but generally speaking, right, let's look at some of these because we should remember these by now. Expository, observational, participatory, reflexive, and performative. So there are examples of each one of these modes in the film. Okay, so expository mode, that is the, the voiceover, the voice of God, whatever you wish to call it, uh, a commanding voice, right? A narrative voice that allows the images to make sense. We know where we are. We know what's going on. People speak, uh, you know, speak to the camera, speak to, to a reporter, and they kind of fill in the blanks, right? They tell us what's going on. Now, in this case, the entire film, right, is somewhat expository. And we have uh, Treadwell, you know, that is uh, screaming about the Park Services people. Uh, we have him talking to us, you know, to the camera, telling us what's going on, why we're seeing the things that we're seeing. You know, he gives us all kinds of color commentary on, uh, I mean, li literally a whole range of ver various things. So, yes, in that sense, it is expository. Um, but the Park Services stuff is uh, is pretty strange because as this is going on, Herzog kind of mutes uh, Treadwell's voice, kind of, you know, uh, turns it down a little bit. And he, Herzog, provides a kind of counter narrative to describe what is happening to Treadwell. We know what's going on. He's pissed off at the park services for a whole variety of things, you know, having him up there that remind him that, you know, this is dangerous. He should be doing this. And so the scene shifts slightly from Treadwell's tirade against park services to a commentary by Herzog about his mental well-being, right? That psychological kind of instability that's starting to happen. Because at this point now, Treadwell is is mistaking people who should, you know, should be helping him, mistaking them uh, as enemies. And that does happen. So is that expository or is that contradictory? Very much is it's contradictory is contradictory because it's revealing something else about Treadwell that perhaps at the moment we may not have thought of or was not meant to be originally in the in the shot but Herzog intervenes right he interjects with a voiceover and kind of colors with commentary what we should really be thinking about which is Treadwell's sort of devolving sense of of right and wrong you know of what is natural and unnatural okay the other one is the observational mode uh, throughout the early part of the film we see lots of sort of observational uh, material uh, which is again very lovely because it looks like this is a remarkable park to to be in providing you don't get eaten by grizzlies so lots of long takes uh treadwell shooting footage you know there's just the kind of a long not a long shot from far away although some of them are but a long take you know ones that are that are one two three minutes long uh there's very little uh, narration either by treadwell or by herzog Her, uh, neither one of them really sort of speak uh, because Herzog might make kind of a color commentary about how beautiful some of the shots are, and it kind of lets lets them go, right? Just really kind of observational. Um, but these scenes don't establish Treadmill, uh, uh, Treadwell as the kind of nature lover that he thinks he is, because he always seems to be kind of bitching out something about the lack of rain or the fact that uh, the park rangers are doing something you know to protect the grizzly uh, bear population uh that you know the fox that are that are running around or aren't you know well fed and so on so they may be observational scenes but treadwell is providing a lot of his own color commentary in the film uh participatory uh it kind of happens well it's participatory again that would be the person literally interjecting themselves into the scene. Uh, Herzog, we know, is a director. He does speak and he provides voiceover, just like Treadwell does. Uh, but there is a participatory mode that is really kind of important, a crucial one. And that's the scene with Jewel and Herzog. And so we see Herzog in front of the camera. Uh, and he's telling Jewel, uh, Timothy Treadwell's sister, not to listen to the audio recording of Treadwell's death. Um, and so here, uh, it is participatory because what Herzog is saying and doing is controlling the narrative. 
it is controlling the action uh, and the degree of participation of Jewel. Um, so, so Jewel, not uh, girlfriend, his, his friend, uh, my mistake. Um, Jewel, because uh, Amy is his girlfriend. So Jewel, uh, a friend. And what Herzog is doing is he's telling us the content of this, of the, of the footage. We don't hear it and we don't see it, but we see Herzog listening to it. So he is very much participating in the events that we see unfolding on the screen. Uh, lots of uh, the use of the, you know, the pronoun I, I uh, Herzog, um, you know, I would not have done this. I think this, I think these are beautiful shots. I think Treadwell is making a mistake. So this pronoun I is very much front and center in the presentation of the material, right? And the participatory nature of the material. Because when we talk about I, uh, they tend to stress personal opinion. Right. When we talk, when we say, for example, we write an essay, we use we or one, um, we're implying that we're not the only ones who think this way. When we use the pronoun I, there's an implication that this is more a sort of a subjective idea or an opinion. And a lot of that is happening in the film. Okay. The reflexive mode. Uh, this is where there is doubt being cast on the ability of film to capture truth. And sure, it may capture truth 24 frames a second, but is it really? Think about the, the scene that you'll, you'll, you'll watch in the film where Timothy Treadwell is screaming at the park services people, and it looks a certain way. But Herzog intervenes with his own color commentary on Treadwell's behavior, and it kind of colors, you know, it seasons that scene differently, and we start thinking of different things. So the reflexive mode, um, is partly uh, Herzog talking about some of the very beautiful shots that Treadwell has taken, right? He is the filmmaker within the film. Um, uh, Herzog's idea of uh, the magic of cinema, uh, glorious improvised moments, seeming, seemingly empty moments with a strange beauty. Uh, there are many, many shots that are like that, especially these, these vistas, these gorgeous vistas with the mountains off in the distance. Uh, they're quite lovely, right? But as he says, seemingly empty moments with a, that have a strange beauty. Now, they have a strange beauty because we know what's going to happen. So there's a kind of disquietness, right? Or disquietude, if that's even a word, um, in these in these otherwise lovely images. So are they capturing truth for sure? Well, we didn't even know at the time that that Treadwell's girlfriend, Amy, was filming most of it. She's basically like this silent witness. Um, and I'm not saying that she cannot, you know, grasp the truth, but there are things that we don't know that are important in terms of fully understanding what is going on. Uh, the fact, for example, that Treadwell would often take, you know, five, 10, 15 different takes of the same, the same scene, we'll say, well, they're home movies. How can they be scenes? But for Treadwell, they are, right? That's, that's how he sees them. And then, so the performative mode, um, the fact that, that both Treadwell and Herzog present themselves as directors or perhaps as characters in their own films. Uh, there's a kind of doubling, uh, like a doubling effect of Treadwell director main subject and Herzog director main subject. The two of them coexist in the same film, which makes it rather remarkable. Okay, so by playing each of these modes, Her Herzog is able to change or recompose Treadwell's, fo uh, Treadwell's footage to create a film that is perhaps very different from what Treadwell originally uh, intended. Uh, probably a very positive view of grizzly bears and how we can interact with them. And they're not as bad as, you know, really we, th we think they are. And the footage may be done with the best of intentions. But what Herzog has done is he's taken this footage uh, and made it about something far more universal, right? The battle between humanity and nature. Uh, the, the, the alleged cunning of humanity and the powerful indifference of nature. Nature doesn't care who you are. Uh, if there's going to be a tornado, there's going to be a tornado. It doesn't select. It will simply go right through the middle of the town and tear it all up. Whether it hits a bank, a church, you know, a synagogue or a school or a person's house, doesn't matter. It's, it's indifferent. And so this footage for Herzog presents this indifference beautifully. The fact that these grizzly bears are just kind of wandering around, like you said, you know, half bored stare at lunch. <laughs> like, 
let that sink in. That's a powerful line. So as we're watching this footage, and it's been reconstructed, it's been restructured by Herzog to present this, you know, this, this fatal, it is a fatal battle, right, between humanity and nature. But it's also about uh, the breakdown of Treadwell's, his sanity, his inability to see friend versus foe. Grizzly bears are good, park rangers are bad. When in any other situation, it would, it would be the opposite. Uh, but that's what, that's what was happening with Treadwell. Every time he'd go back year after year, he would have reinforced to himself the fact that being with grizzly bears was perhaps better than being with human beings, right? They're going to hurt you less. Well, maybe emotionally less, but they can kill you. So those kinds of things are become really important to Herzog because we see that, yes, Treadwell is an animal lover, but he also is completely alienated from almost his humanity. He, he wants to be a grizzly bear, right? He wants to be a grizzly man. That's essentially what's going on. So it is a remarkable film in that sense. Uh, all kinds of issues about sanity and, uh, and, and impending insanity. Uh, quote, I'm in love with my animal friends. I'm in love with my animal friends. We hear him say repeatedly. Um, he screams about the lack of rain. And he, con you know, he condemns uh, uh, God, Allah, whoever, whoever's listening. And finally it rains and he seems to kind of you know be at one and at peace with nature that nature is you know no longer is it, uh, an enemy it's now back to being being his friend um he misreads things uh, the photographers are not there to harm him or to harm nature they're photographers they're really no different than him but again he sees them as a threat right he's losing touch he's losing his grip on reality and thinking grizzly bears are good or friendly when in fact they're not and photographers and park rangers and anybody else who's there is an enemy of some sort so the the kind of what he calls a creepy messages uh to that are left uh, for him to read on the rocks um yeah they're they're kind of taunting him they may look at him the photographers that is you know at, at treadwell as maybe kind of a, a harmless fool uh or at least someone harmless so they leave these kind of creepy messages because they're just kind of they're just kind of screwing around with them but again treadwell who's losing his grip on on sanity reads them as something far worse okay um there's lots of footage of Treadwell kind of confessing these, you know, in these monologues about his sexuality, his, you know, his drinking, problems he's had with women, problems with he's had with his family, with his friends. So as he's losing grip and replacing the the human world with a natural world, as he's doing this, as he's transitioning from one to the other, th this is when these monologues become quite profound and quite deep and quite revealing and uh, degree of vulnerability, you know, in his life that you m we may not have not uh, may not have seen otherwise. That's what I'm trying to say. So they're uh, they're all really really interesting uh, because ultimately Herzog still, as I say, still has the last word uh, in the structure of the story because that really is what matters. Ultimately, it's what Herzog does with the material that makes a film greater than what it could have been just in the hands of Treadwell himself. So, um, Vincente uh, Rodriguez Ortega says, in the end, Herzog does indeed give absolute power to the very nature Treadwell confined to the back of the frame in his numerous self-centered testimonies. Grizzly Man is not ultimately about how Treadwell succeeded and eventually failed to survive in the midst of a, of a callous nature, but conversely, about the genetic ruthlessness that reigns supreme in the natural world. Well, that's that's very much Herzog, right? That nature will will win. In the end, nature will win. Will win because think of us. We're not we're not born with claws or with fur. We have no natural instinct to survive other than simply survival, but we survive by our wits. We don't survive by strength or you know our ability to chew through bone or something it's we're actually very vulnerable we are extremely vulnerable as as human animals right as mammals so this is kind of what the film is showing us that it's perhaps a reminder that we are more fragile than we than we realize okay so in terms of nature these are, these are the important ideas that we want to you know that we want to convey here because it is all the way through the film a kind of you know a battle of wills so the the battle between 
the human and the natural world, the battle between Treadwell and the outside world that he sees threatening. Uh, there's the battle between Treadwell, the director, and Herzog, the director, Treadwell, the character, Herzog, the characters, uh, character. Uh, but there is, you know, there is a, uh, a sense of battles being played out on these different levels, physical and metaphysical, if you like. Um, and so even though we know what will, what happens at the end, the film is still remarkable because it does present a whole range of other ideas. So even though we know how the story ends, um, you know, and it is tragic, but uh, there is something about that footage. Uh, I mean, for Treadwell to watch his footage, perhaps he's convincing himself that what he's doing is, is correct. So as he watches back some of the footage, now he hasn't done anything with it, could be watching the camera, and these confessions that he is basically telling himself convinces himself that what he's doing is correct. But in so doing, he is losing touch with reality, losing touch with, you know, right and wrong and good and bad. And so we are watching this, watching this person kind of unfurl, right, mentally and physically unfurl. So, uh, you know, the, is it dangerous for us because we know what, what happens? Does, is that say something about ourselves like you know i hope we see some footage of him being eaten alive well no of course not but we're watching someone whose whose life has already ended which is kind of a strange thing so the film essentially starts with him already you know having expired but we're watching all this material as it inexorably leaves right uh concludes with his death and then shortly after so no matter what, regardless of the battles, regardless of all the different, uh, you know, sort of struggles that are going on between the natural world and the human world and so on, and between Herzog and Treadwell, Herzog does give Treadwell, you know, his due in terms of being a filmmaker. Uh, and not only that, but also being passionate. Because this is, some, this is something else that megalomaniacs are very good at. They're super passionate about what they're doing to the point of being a danger to themselves. So this is something that Herzog finds appealing in Treadwell's character. Not only is he a reasonably good filmmaker, although he does tend to stand in the middle of the frame and pontificate for you know minutes on end, but there's something about Treadwell as a person. He is, is overwhelming passion for these animals that are clearly dangerous. Herzog is, is respectful, right? He respects that passion. The fact that he's not, you know, not afraid to live what he believes. There are a few people that do that. Now, when you do that, often you can go overboard because you're doing something that others would not otherwise do willingly. So there is something in Herzog's uh, respect of Treadwell as, as a passionate advocate that is quite remarkable. So, uh, Herzog again says, majority of what he left was of grizzlies fishing for salmon, bear cubs fluffy and cuddly with their mom. I knew that there was maybe 50 hours of just looking at bears, seeing them in the river catching salmon, which would, which would have constituted a very fine nature film. But my film is not a nature film. It's a film about human nature. So what Herzog is saying is as beautiful as those images are, there's a real story. The real story is the filmmaker that shot that footage the filmmaker that appears within his own film. And so that's where that's where Herzog really finds that main interest in Treadwell's, you know, behavior is that he crosses that line, right? He crosses that boundary into pure nature. He is living with animals. Now Herzog, on the other hand, uh, respects that, but he also has a healthy respect for the the beauty and power of the natural world, something that Tre Treadwell had kind of lost. Now, when we talk about boundaries, right, we're watching a film uh, or sh footage shot by someone who was killed by the very subjects that he was filming. So there, that should make us uncomfortable. Um, and so boundaries in filmmaking, uh, we should question our relationship to it, because just like in Capturing the Freedmans, um, there was footage that we weren't even supposed to see. Remember the scene quite early? David says, you know, you shouldn't be, if, if you were watching this, you shouldn't be. Like, this isn't meant for you. And then he addressed the, the cops in particular. So there's a notion of invasion of privacy, right? The invasive nature of our viewing of Treadwell's material. Yes, he may have 
shot something 15 times and we don't, we're, not, we're not sure which take the Herzog is using. Could be the first, could be the last, we don't know. We also don't know what, what order the film was originally uh, created versus the version that Herzog presents to us. So the boundaries that the filmmaker takes, uh, there is all this found footage, you know, of someone who's already dead. Now think of capturing the Freedmans. Um, the, the, the father, Mr. Friedman himself, right? He's, he's already dead. So Arthur Friedman is already dead before the film is even made. So this is the, you know, a character that is no longer able to speak for himself. Uh, and yeah, so he, they're not there, uh, are able to speak for themselves. They all, they're also the main subject. So there's something really strange. We need to, to treat this material with some degree of respect because they're not there. To, to talk back, to say, no, that's not what I was thinking. We have to make certain assumptions in structuring the film and hope that what we're saying may be to a certain degree or to a certain extent what the the original you know thought may have been. Um, the uh, corner, uh, the, the tape listing scene, the corner scene, I mean, he's describing you know what was left of, uh, of Mr. Treadwell and his girlfriend. Uh, and he says, you know, we're not into snuff movies. There's a borderline of discretion and a responsibility for to Timothy and Amy and to the parents of both. And it's true. Uh, and yet the coroner describes her death in exaggerated and grisly fashion. So we're kind of prying uh, by this point, you know, perhaps a little bit too far. We know they died. We need to know all the details. Does that change the story in, in any way? So some concluding thoughts, right, before watching the film. Did Treadwell actually help or hurt the Grizzlies? Um, that's a valid question. Uh, the plight of the Grizzlies have, are, is now better known, but did he help them at all? Uh, that's a question you can ask yourself as, as you watch the film. Um, this idea of uh, Grizzly people, people that are going to help uh, the Grizzly population, not by going and living with them, but at least you know funding the park rangers that are there, the people who do run the national park to make sure that there is food and shelter and these kinds of things and that they're, they're not hunted. So the Grizzly People organization, it, uh, you know, a nonprofit organization is a good idea. So did Tread Treadwell help? He did a little bit. Um, but he also does some odd things by showing sort of, uh, disrespect, you know, to the, to the, to the bears, you know, how, how would we coexist with grizzly bears? We won't want, do we want them wandering up and down the street? Well, of course not. They're, they're dangerous animals. So there is, there is that, the fact that, okay, so we're going to help them for what reason? Like they certainly can, you know, can take care of their own. Uh, and yes, they may go hungry, but certainly if, you know, a well-fed grizzly is less likely to attack. Maybe that's the only motivation. Um, there's the fact that Treadwell made bears more accustomed to humans. By being in their, you know, in their presence all the time, bears now become used to the idea of humans. So when they, when humans arrive, perhaps even by accident, bears are more likely to come up to them. And so perhaps that makes them more dangerous to humans. So these questions are raised, um, but they should be raised in our minds. But Herzog doesn't really answer them, but they're certainly questions that you can have in the back of your minds as you, as you watch it. Did Treadwell's work you know, his, his missionary work will say, did it actually work out for the better? Are Grizzlies better off with his, you know, nonprofit organization, Grizzly people? What exactly do they do? Uh, they, you know, they're not going to buy condominiums for these animals because they're animals. So instead, has he actually made it worse, right? Has he made these Grizzly bears used to human, uh, you know, the human population? So now they're going to more likely wander, you know, into areas where people are living. That makes them a lot more dangerous. Okay, so that is um, Grizzly Man. Uh, this is the last slide. So I'm going to be back in just a moment with some information on Into the Abyss. Okay, we're back with uh, our sort of second short feature. Um, I don't need for you to watch the entire film. What I'd like you to do, though, is to have a look at the first, say, 10 minutes as usual. Kind of, it gives you the, it sets the stage for what the film is, is like, its style, and what it's about. Uh, Oh, I've got to move my mouse here just for a sec. So Into the Abyss, uh, first of all, Herzog, very briefly again, 
uh, to remind you, uh, born in Germany, grew up in a very remote village, uh, not a whole lot of uh, sort of mass media and technology, never saw a telephone or TV or even a film as a child, made his first phone call at 17. <laughs> Think about that. We have three-year-olds that can operate cell phones now. Uh, worked in a steel factory in high school, made his first film at 19, and has since then produced more than 40 films that are both narrative and uh, documentary, so fiction and nonfiction. Um, Heracles uh, in 1962 on bodybuilding, uh, Acquire the Wrath of God, I mentioned, Art of Glass, who Grizzly Man, and this film, uh, Into the Abyss. Now, that film, again, it's about extraordinary people. Now, extraordinary people are not necessarily wonderful, grand individuals. Extraordinary may be in the case of these two individuals, two men who were convicted of a triple homicide in October of 2001. And the murder took place because the men wanted to steal a car, something as simple as that, a red Camaro. And so these two, when you think about it, it's like they killed three people for just a car. I mean, that's how warped is that? So Michael Perry, uh, Jason Burkett, Michael Perry was on death row for the murder of uh, Sandra Stotler, uh, connected with the other two murders, but not conv uh, convicted for them. Uh, Jason uh, Burkett since serving a 40-year sentence for the murder of Sandra Stotler. Uh, and Michael Perry, when the film was being made, was being interviewed eight days before his execution. So he knew in eight days he would die. So that's, I think, part of what Herzog finds fascinating with these people. They are extraordinary in the sense that they, they murdered people. Now, that's not something, thankfully, that is normal. Uh, it seems to be, there seems to be a shooting every, you know, a mass shooting every day in the States. But to pull the trigger uh, to kill someone, I think to Herzog represents something superhuman, something extraordinary, because it's not what people normally do. So abnormal uh, behavior, unusual behavior, this is, I think, what Herzog is attracted to. So we have these two individuals, Michael Perry, you know, about to be executed. So imagine that weighing on your mind. Every morning you wake up, it's one day shorter to your own death. So uh, I think this is what, what Herzog found fascinating about these people. Because it's not as if people, you know, have never killed anyone before. We have, unfortunately. But it is the fact that he's on death row. So Into the Abyss is essentially that. It is about being in this abyss, uh, staring death in the face, essentially. So for Herzog, when he's working on a film, allegedly he doesn't make a distinction between fiction and nonfiction or fiction and documentary. For him, they're just films. Um, often he has, uh, Herzog has made films, uh, Caspar Hauer is one, Aguirre, The Wrath of God. These are based on actual living individuals, people who actually existed in history. So he kind of takes these stories and elaborates them, but probably from what they really were, may not have to elaborate them very much. But the fact that they are fictionalized representations of people who actually existed. Uh, it's a very kind of postmodern view of, of history making, uh, where we don't try to follow it to the letter of the law and make sure that every fact is there and substantiated. Herzog takes these real people and uses them to tell a story. So that's why he sees them as just, you know, they're not two different styles, they're just films. So real life and fiction uh, really are mutually inclusive, not exclusive. Both of them feed off each other. Uh, they're poetically interacting. Uh, and for him, right, life imitates art and art imitates life. Uh, the two of them go hand in hand. Now, there are some people that say Herzog has a certain worldview that it can be kind of bleak and sort of Nietzschean, you know, the Superman trying to you know, overcome everything. Um, that can be bleak at times because the people that do this tend to be or end up being outsiders. They become the Timothy Treadwells of the world, where people, you know, can't live with these individuals. So they, they end up just wandering off, right? They wander off into the wilderness. And Treadwell literally does this. Now, uh, Casper Hauer, um, Aguirre, these other characters in Herzog's fiction films are along the same lines, right? They are outsiders who either are rejected by their own society or they reject the society that they're in. And of course, 
in so doing, uh, as they wander away and, you know, try to live a world that or a life that they believe to be theirs and theirs alone, they're eventually crushed, right? They're crushed because there's no one else around them to, to, to support that which what you're, they're trying to do. Um, Herzog also made, uh, made a beautiful version of the Dracula story, uh, Nosferatu, uh, not a remake necessarily because it was reinvented and rethought. But again, think of the character of Dracula, lives in a castle away from everybody, you know, who's a nocturnal uh, vampire. So he can't really fit into society. He can't stand out in daylight. So he is, he's a misfit. He's an outsider. So Herzog is really fascinated by these kinds of characters because he looks at these characters as a reminder that society is always on the edge of falling apart. These people, because they are so powerful and so passionate or megalomaniac, uh, megalomaniacal, I guess is the word, um, they can not only self-destruct, but they can take civilization down with it. So that's, that's never a good thing. Uh, a weird story in 1980, uh, a film was made called Werner Herzog Eats His Shoe. I've seen it. It's actually rather am uh, amusing. Uh, and what it was about was that Werner Herzog made a bet with Errol Morris, director of The Fog of War, Thin Blue Line, and, and several other films. He made a bet with Errol Morris that Morris would not be able to make a film. And Morris made his film. So Herzog lost his bet and had to eat, eat his shoe. So as it says here, Herzog was not uh, denigrating Morris as a filmmaker or saying he didn't have any talent. It wasn't any kind of an attack. It was a way to encourage him, you know, to, to really try to work hard as best he could to get that first film off the ground. And sure enough, he did. But the downside is because of Herzog's, you know, promise, um, he had to eat a shoe. So he cooked it in duck fat and uh, he ate it at, at uh, Morris's uh uh, presentation of uh, Gates of Heaven. So there it is. Be careful what you wish for, right? Because sometimes it may backfire. So Herzog is a fascinating filmmaker, S still alive, still around, uh, still working. Uh, and so Herzog uh, does have a fascination with these kinds of superhuman individuals, these kind of Nietzschean supermen, we'll say. Uh, and when we talk about Herzog in terms of Grizzly Man, couple of things we want to think about, uh, the narrative function, uh, the voiceover function that we traditionally associate with the expository style, how different it is here, because the expository voice is really not uh, narrating, it's commenting. It's commenting and providing, you know, ideas about what we're seeing. It's not simply saying, think this, think that, here's what's going on. No, there is, there is reflection. There is comment, uh, commentary by Herzog about the footage that we are watching on the screen. He's asking us to think about different things. Um, and the one scene you'll see towards the end, you know, Herzog clearly says, I would not have done that. <laughs> and that's not, that's not what you would expect from a voiceover. Now, uh, does that have any other effects on our inter interpretations? Yes, the particular way in which Herzog narrates the film and participates in the film. We see him clearly at one point, one very crucial scene, a very di difficult scene where he's with Jewel and they're listening to the audio portion of that awful tape of Tim Timothy Treadwell's death. There he, it's uh, participatory, but the rest of it is for the most part expository, but of a really different kind. Because here, as the slides say, the filmmaker Herzog is a kind of mediator, right? He stands between us, the viewer, and Treadwell and his, and his found footage. So he mediates that interaction between what we see, what we hear, what we think, what we're asked to be, to think about by Tread, uh, Treadwell and what we're asked to think about by Herzog. Do those two complement one, one another? Do they contrast one another? Or do they come into conflict with one another? So the mediator can do just that. So, if you think of that, think of Herzog's voice and the control he has of the narrative as a kind of mediator to help us to understand certain elements that are going on, uh, as well as providing commentary and sort of critical analysis uh, on what it is that we are seeing, perhaps beyond the physical reality of, of the images, as beautiful as they may be. 
we're also seeing someone losing grip with reality, losing grip with, with his sanity. So that's very important. So the mediation becomes crucial in allowing us to see that you know un, unfurl throughout the film. Um, that's pretty well it. So uh, there will be a viewing quiz on this film. It should be the last one. Uh, there also is a reading quiz. Uh, we'll talk about it on Wednesday, and I'll give you some of the highlights of the film. Uh, and I think the quiz is open till next week. Um, and next week also will be uh, the due date for your for your essay, the uh, the final essay, the final piece of information. A uh, week after that, we're going to be talking about the final exam, which is mostly mul multiple choice, and I think three out of four short essay questions. So we'll talk about that next week. In the meantime, enjoy the film. It is very, very good, uh, and have a good week, and I'll see you on Wednesday.